So as we just stated, higher boiling point materials will stay in the flask here, such as solids and higher boiling point materials, whereas lower boiling point materials will collect in the condensation flask here. Okay. Um, some examples of homogeneous mixtures that can be separated by distillation are as follows. First, we have petroleum. All I need you to know about petroleum for now is that it's a mixture of hydrocarbons. You don't need to know what a hydrocarbon is right now, so don't worry about that. But, tr but petroleum is a homogeneous mixture of hydrocarbons. And in particular, how you separate um, petroleum is you use distillation. And during distillation, the hydrocarbons with the lower boiling points will evaporate first, become a gas, you know, travels the gas through this tube, and since it's traveling through this tube and there's cooling parts down here, it will cool um, and eventually become a liquid when it collects in the condensation flask here, right? So hydrocarbons with lower boiling points will evaporate first and eventually be cooled back to its liquid form when it collects as um, a liquid in the condensation flask here. And obviously the uh, hydrocarbons with the higher boiling point will um, will stay in the original flask here. Another example of a homogeneous mixture that can be separated by distillation is salt water. And salt water obviously is an aqueous solution of sodium chloride, right? You have salt, which is a solid, and water, which is a liquid. And obviously, since salt is a solid and water is a liquid, water would have the lower boiling point because it's already a liquid to begin with, right? So when you, um, when you use distillation on a sample of salt water, you'll find that the water obviously will boil first because that's the lower boiling point. It will um, travel freely as a gas through this tube and it will be cool during that time. And as a result of the cooling, the water will collect back in liquid form in this condensation flask here, right? So in summary, water, since it has a lower boiling point, will be separated and collect by itself in this condensation flask here leaving only the salt behind in the original container. So for example, salt would be behind, left behind in the original container, whereas the water and salt water would collect in the, in the uh, condensation flask here, okay? So salt and water can be separated by distillation based on boiling points because since water has a lower boiling point, it will collect in the condensation flask here, whereas the salt will remain in the, in the original flask here. On the other hand, in petroleum, uh, hydrocarbons with higher boiling point will remain in the original flask here, whereas hydrocarbons with lower boiling points will be separated and will collect by themselves in the, uh, in the final condensation flask here. Okay? Now let's move on to the final method of separation, chromatography. So chromatography is a method used to separate parts of dyes. In other words, it's used to separate ink dye mixtures. Right, so again, I want you to only memorize A through D as well as the details of the diagram below. Okay, so um, in particular, chromatography is used to separate um, ink dye mixtures, okay? Now, the properties involved in chromatography are um, solubility and polarity. So solubility, again, just means the ability to dissolve molecular polarity. You don't need to worry about that right now. You don't need to know what it means. We're not learning about that yet. All you need to know right now in terms of properties generally, aside from solubility and polarity being the properties of chromatography, is that um, the more soluble or polar something is, the further upwards it travels in chromatography. All right, chromatography is set up where you have... Um, a piece of paper with the ink blotted on it, and it's put in a, in uh, water usually. All right, so it's a paper with ink blots on it because you want to separate the ink dye mixture, and you put it in water, and um, you separate um, ink dye mixtures based on solubility and polarity. More soluble or more polar uh, parts of the mixture will travel further up the paper when you separate the ink dye mixture. Okay. We'll go into this in particular with the summary right now. In particular, during chromatography, more soluble or polar materials will go um, further up to the top. That's because um, when you put a paper in water, water will um, travel actually up the paper. So the more something dissolves or the mo more polar it is, the more easily it can mix with the water and travel with it as it bleeds up through the paper. So more soluble or polar materials go up to the top as the water travels because obviously um, that part of the ink dye mixture has either dissolved or become one with the paper so it can travel with it up the paper. On the other hand, less soluble or less polar materials 
will stay at the bottom. That's because obviously they don't dissolve in water. Cause they, so they sit there and they're like, I don't care if you're moving up, I'm going to stay down here. So less soluble and less polar materials will stay at the bottom because they don't dissolve and they don't become one with the water. Okay, so that's very eloquently summarized in this diagram. I summarized in blue at the, t that, uh, at the top here that more soluble and polar components will separate and travel further up to the top. On the other hand, less soluble and less polar components will stay at the bottom because they don't care that the water's traveling. They're like, whatever. All right, an example of a mixture that can be separated by chromatography is a pen ink mixture. Um, if you have a slip of paper and put pen ink on it um, and you you know, use chromatography and let the water bleed up through the paper, you'll see that the pen ink mixture separates into colors with the more soluble and more polar colors actually moving further up the column and obviously the less polar and less soluble uh, colors staying at the bottom. Okay, that's it. So I'm um, just make sure you understand this. For example, uh, let's go through this diagram just to get a feel for this and just to get an example. Let's say we have a drop of food coloring, right? And let's say we want to separate that drop of food coloring. So what we do is um, at the start of the process, we dip the paper in water and eventually what you'll see is that um, red goes further up to the top and pink stays at the bottom. And um, the whole idea here is that red, because it's more soluble and polar, was the one that traveled up further to the top, whereas pink, being the less soluble and less polar component, stayed further down towards the bottom. Okay, that's it. Now let's go through the guided practice questions. Number one asks you to find the sample of matter that can be separated into different substances by physical means. So since the sample of matter has to be able to be separated into different substances by physical means, we know that we need a mixture by definition. And since we are only given symbols here, we need to be able to detect the mixture based on symbol. If you remember, um, Mixtures can be determined symbolically if they have AQ in parentheses after the substance. That's because AQ in parentheses after the substance means it's an aqueous solution of that substance. In other words, it's a homogeneous mixture that forms when the substance completely dissolves in water and completely mixes, it, mixes with water to form the solution, right? Um, the only one that meets this qualification with the AQ in parentheses is CO. AQ, which again we know means an aqueous solution of CO or a homogeneous mixture of CO that formed when the CO completely dissolved in the water to form the homogeneous mixture or in particular the aqueous solution. So this is the answer, COAQ. The reason again for this is because this is a homogeneous mixture because the AQ suggests that it is an aqueous solution. And the substances are obviously combined physically uh, as suggested by the question. Since, this is, since the substances are combined physically, they can be separated physically, right? There you go. And number two, based on the mixtures we're given, we have to identify the method, we have to explain our answer, and we have to note the properties involved in each separation method. So first we have petroleum, which you should have memorized by now, is a homogeneous mixture of hydrocarbons. All right, so make sure you memorize that petroleum is a homogeneous mixture of hydrocarbons. Since petroleum is a homogeneous mixture of hydrocarbons, by definition, we should be able to use distillation because homogeneous mixtures are separated by distillation. And we choose distillation because um, different parts of the mixture have different boiling points, right? The uh, lower boiling point materials will evaporate first and collect in the condensation flask, whereas the higher boiling point materials will stay in the original flask. That's how you separate them, okay? Sand, table salt, and sugar, on the other hand, we know by definition is heterogeneous. That's because if you um, put sand, table salt, and sugar in the same container, you can see sand is different from table sugar and salt because sand is brown, table sugar is white, and so is sugar. Uh, so table salt and sugar are white, whereas sand is brown, so you can tell it's heterogeneous. Furthermore, table salt and sugar, even though they have the same color, are differently sized, right? Since this is a heterogeneous mixture, by definition, we can use filtration. The reason for that is because um, some parts of the mixture, namely sand, are insoluble and large, while other parts of the mixture, namely table salt and sugar, are much more small and much more soluble. All right? So that's the reasoning. The properties involved, obviously, are solubility and size. The sand, since it's insoluble and large, cannot pass through the filter since it's too big and it can't mix with the water, so it can't travel with the water, right? Uh, so therefore, sand stays in the filter. On the other hand, table salt and sugar are very small particles in comparison to sand, and so they can 
fit through the filter. Also, they're both soluble in water, so they can dissolve with the water, become one with it, and travel with it down into the beaker, right? So uh, the table salt and sugar will travel down to the beaker, whereas the sand will stay behind the filter. Now, the third example, air, is homogeneous. How do you know that? As if you just look up from your computer, you'll see that air is invisible. It all looks like it's just one thing, even though we know it's actually a mixture. Since air all looks like one thing, even though it's a mixture, we know it's homogeneous. Since it's homogeneous, we know the method by definition is distillation, since distillation separates uh, homogeneous mixtures. And we choose distillation because the different parts of the mixture have different boiling points, right? So the properties involved obviously are different boiling points. Um, and lower boiling point materials will evaporate first and collect in the um, condensation flask, whereas the higher boiling point materials will stay behind. Ink mixtures next um, obviously are ink dye mixtures because they contain ink. So ink dye mixtures by definition can be separated by chromatography because chromatography separates dye mixtures. Right, and we choose chromatography because different parts of an ink mixture can be separated based on the properties of solubility and polarity. So that's the explanation, the properties are, are solubility and polarity, right? And obviously the uh, more soluble and more polar the material is, the further it'll travel up the column because the more it can dissolve and become one with water, whereas the lower boiling point materials will stay behind because they don't dissolve as much. All right, uh, next we have ethanol, vinegar, and water. If you mix it, they're, all three of them generally are clear, so you can actually separate it. Uh, uh, sorry, all of them are clear, so they form a homogeneous mixture. And since it's a homogeneous mixture, you choose distillation because distillation separates homogeneous mixtures. And obviously, the explanation, which includes the properties, is we choose distillation because the different parts of the mixture have different boiling points, right? They have different boiling points, that's it. Uh, and you, you know the explanation for distillation. We went over that before. KCl AQ, as we can see, is an aqueous solution based on the AQ. Since it's an aqueous solution based on the AQ, meaning it mixes with water, we know that it's a homogeneous mixture because aqueous solutions are homogeneous mixtures. So the mixture is homogeneous. Since it's homogeneous, we choose distillation because the different parts of the mixture have different boiling points. And obviously, KCl, being a solid, has a different boiling point than water, which is the liquid does. The KCl... Um, has a higher boiling point so it would stay behind in the original flask whereas water being a liquid has a lower boiling point so it evaporate then um, collect as a liquid in the condensation flask that's how they'd be separated okay kcl in the original flask and water collects in the final condensation flask now we have a kcl aq and agcls we can see that kcl aq is an aqueous solution or homogeneous mixture whereas agcl is insoluble based on the S, so that's the heterogeneous part of the mixture. So since we have one part that's soluble in water and one part that's insoluble or sits down at the bottom, this is heterogeneous. KCl AQ becomes one with the water because it dissolves and AGCl does not mix with the water because it's insoluble. Since it's heterogeneous, by de definition we use filtration because one part of the mixture, AGCl in particular, is insoluble and large while the other part of the mixture, KCl AQ, is soluble and large. And obviously the properties involved here are um, solubility, size, and density, right?